So this leads us into our actual hypothesis testing, our statistical testing. Okay, so I'm going to kind of go through quite a bit of this relatively fast, just because we've done some of these things. So we, um, in hypothesis testing, we have our two hypotheses, our null hypothesis, our alternative hypothesis, and we have our p-values. Basically, our p-values allow us to say, do we accept or reject the null, I'm sorry, do we reject the null hypothesis or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? You really shouldn't say accept because, again, accepting makes it sound like you're approving that this is true, where really all we're doing is saying, we're rejecting null hypothesis. And if we reject null hypothesis, well, that means that null hypothesis is likely not true. Therefore, the alternative hypothesis seems to be more, seems to be more likely to be true. Um, but saying we accept seems more like, essentially it's like when you say you prove something. It's like in science, you don't prove anything. You basically keep testing until you're with a shadow of a doubt. It's like, okay, this is probably true, but you can never exactly prove it. That's kind of the, um, a slight, you know, like the way you're phrasing, but I think it's important, okay, just to kind of remind yourself. Um, again, p-value is just kind of like how, like, you can think of like the p-value is that how likely something is true, considering the null hypothesis is true, and if you have a very small p-value, it means it's relatively unlikely, like, it seems pretty unlikely that this is true if we assume the null hypothesis, and that's why we can reject it. Okay, um, alpha, which I think we kind of talked about a little bit, but not really. This is our critical value. It's tied with our p-value, um, but basically it's like our cutoff saying, when do we say we can actually um, reject our null hypothesis? So usually alpha set at like uh, 0 0.05. So if our p-value is smaller than alpha, we can reject our null hypothesis. That's the idea there. Um, and note that our p-value in this case, um, we can also talk about like, We'll talk about this T statistic and our T critical value, but you can think of alpha as kind of like, where's our threshold? Where do we say it's okay? And it's really important, we'll talk about this a little bit, but it's really important that um, your alpha value is set ahead of time. Um, because if you wait until after you do your analysis, then you might actually, you know, like at least maybe even subconsciously or maybe even purposely, you want to adjust that alpha value. It's like, well, I was really looking for an alpha for this value to make your um, value uh, significant. So. Just be aware of that, that try to be a good experimental experimenter as a data scientist. Okay. Um, effect size. So this is something kind of pretty new. So this is used in a lot of meta-analysis to compare multiple studies. Um, a meta-analysis, do you guys know what a meta-analysis is by chance? I think I mentioned just a second ago. Yeah. So a meta-analysis is kind of like what it is. It's analyzing other analysis, other research. So this is usually like when you have like you know, let's say, for let's say the medical field, this, I'm gonna keep going to medical field because that's where a lot of studies tend to come up. Um, is that if you have like different research, like they do, it, um, they see like, you know, is chocolate um, good for your heart? You know, let's say high cholesterol or something, like it raises cholesterol. And this research, or this group did one research on that, and then another group did another research on that, and another group did research on that on the same subject. And you wanna basically compare those researchers. You wanna kind of group them together and talk about that research as a whole. Because any one particular research, right, could have just by chance um, find a p-value that's lower than the alpha just by pure chance. So you want to basically be able to have it reproduced and be able to compare all those researches. Just remember, um, that's the whole idea is when we do a sample, you're never sure if that one sample is actually representative of the population. Ideally, we would do it over and over and over again and see if those samples would consistently be over what we'd expect. Okay, and that hopefully will describe the population more. So that's what a meta-analysis is, basically taking a bunch of study, studies and looking at those together collectively. So that's kind of like what we're, when we talk about for effect size, and the curriculum goes into a lot of detail about how to do this. So um, the next thing is like our miscalculation rate. So, sorry, I'm kind of reading this, kind of remember what I was going to tell you guys. You can calculate a threshold to hold two populations against where two previous ones. Oh, okay. So the idea here is that if we have um, let's say we have one group, like we do a, a study or like we have a sample, um, we might have like a predicted PDF, right? And I'll just do a regular um, a par a parametric PDF. So remember we're using something that's similar to Gaussian. So like, let's say we have a PDF that looks like this. And then we have, let me do another color. We have a PDF that looks like this. Okay, and so this obviously has a different mean, we'll call it like, mu1 and mu2, okay. And really what we want to say is like, okay, how different are these samples? Like, you know, how, like, 
could we accidentally overlap? So I think the, um, what's it called? The curriculum actually talks about, I can't remember what the data was, but basically they were comparing females. We'll, we'll say height just because females and males, this probably would be switched in the real world, but I'm just making something up. So like you can think like, okay, like the height of males and the height of females and saying, okay, this is like their mean, this is, so clearly they're different, but when is their overlap over here? So like, you can kind of think it's like, when would you confuse a height? Like if I was said, if someone, if someone is, you know, five foot seven, how likely is it they're a male versus a female? That's kind of like the idea, like seeing that overlap. And this could be um, also when we talk about like, for studies like a control group and experimental group, our placebo and our treatment, seeing, hey, like, what are these actually different? Where is that overlap? You know, what's the likelihood of this? So we can think of this threshold right here. And um, this is actually the more complicated one. Um, the curriculum does talk about there's a simpler threshold you can talk about, but this one uh, accounts for standard deviation. So note that I put um, sigma and mu. Those are usually considered the population mean and um, population, I just messed up, population standard deviation. Um, I think last time I actually messed up and said standard error instead of, I'm sorry, sample error instead of um, sample standard deviation. It should be sample standard deviation. But this right here, really, when we talk about sigma and mu, they're talking about population. So you can kind of assume that what I'm talking about here is population, but um, just know if it was a sample, you really should technically use S and mu, or S and X bar, okay? Just know that um, that's usually what we see here. But basically this allows us for a threshold to say, okay, uh, what value do we say, okay, what can we compare these two? Where's this overlap? And so this can actually use to calculate the area underneath this curve. And so one way you can do this is basically say, well, okay, let me figure out this overlap right here where these two pdfs actually cross over and say how like basically when is what is the most likelihood of them actually being compared for example if we get a height that's right here we know for pretty good certainty that it's likely male because there are no females in that area but if we got um a value right here well now it's a little fuzzier saying well how likely is it female because how likely is it male so that's kind of the idea is like where we look for this overlap Okay, so again, the, um, this section is very, um, this section is quite large and goes through a whole lot of detail on it. So I'm not going to go completely into this, but know that in the curriculum, they talk about this and they kind of explain a little bit what's going on. They're walking through some code too and showing you. Um, but the main thing you have to realize is that in the end, we're just seeing when these two parts overlap and when they can be confused for one another. Okay. And in the end, usually we use this to calculate the overlap of the area under the curve, AUC. Okay, cool. All right, so there's that. I'm gonna clear this guy out. And now there's the probability of superiority. So this one's, um, I think it's a little easier. Basically it's saying how likely in that, um, I guess I just erased it, that was dumb. But um, when we have those two PDFs, basically saying we have a threshold and say, um, how likely is it that this group is above this threshold. So if you imagine, like, let's say the threshold is right here and saying, okay, how likely is it a male over that threshold? Um, I'm sorry, uh, I'm erase that. I just realized I was saying the wrong thing. You're actually comparing between the two. So for example, if we found that like female, I'll keep it what we had before, female in male, and we took two parts two samples from each of these groups, you know, how likely is it that male is greater than female? Like basically you're trying to figure out what the probability of that is. So this helps us also be able to describe saying, okay, how likely when we get a value, is it in one of these two groups? Okay, so it's another way of basically doing this misclassification rate and this probability of superiority. Okay, and these will kind of come all together. I think um, when we bring it together, it'll make more sense. Okay, so that's just another thing that you can do to kind of compare those two groups. And then our next part is our Cohen's D statistic. Okay, and so this one, you can see it's very similar to this threshold that I calculated right here. Um, but in this case, it's actually looking for the variance. In this case, we call it the pooled variance. And we can actually determine the statistic. And remember our statistic, whenever we talk about a statistic, really what we mean by that is just some way to summarize the data, right? We're trying to summarize the data in some meaningful metric. Okay, and that's why we call it, you know, a statistic. It's describing um, the data that we're looking at, okay? So um, basically this will give us a D and this will allow us to say, hey, like, you know, how likely is 
that are a crossover? How likely, essentially, are these two groups actually the same group or very different groups? So you can think of it like your treatment group in your placebo group. Like that would be an example of what two populate or two groups you would be looking at. So um, this is kind of like so the curriculum talks about this too, and it mentions about um, the the rule of thumb for a D statistic. And basically, you can think of it. Um, these are fuzzy rules. They're not to be like well, the statistic is 0.8 lines between the groups. Um, these can, depending on what you're looking at, it might make more sense to look for a larger D versus a smaller D, okay? So you have to know what the context of your data is. This is where the domain knowledge is really useful. But these are kind of the general ideas like, oh, 0.02 for a D statistic means there's a small effect, if any, and then above 8.8 .8 is a large effect, meaning that there is a significant difference between those two. So, um, Putting all these things together, the miscalculation miscalcul yeah, rate, probability of superiority in Cohen's D statistic. Um, I basically pulled a bunch of this stuff out from the curriculum. So this is all from the curriculum. It's just putting it all together so you can see it more easily. So the first thing, um, basically, the this is just a function so we can actually graph out our PDF um, in the what's it called in the in our graph. We'll basically compare two groups. So we'll evaluate a PDF. And then we're going to do an overlap superiority, basically say, okay, where is that superiority? Um, like we kind of mentioned, and we'll talk about that overlap, which is our misclassific misclassification rate. Basically, where is that overlap where we might misclassify one thing as the other? And then we're actually going to plot them out. So just know that that's what this, um, these functions are doing. And then what's nice is that I can actually give it a specific D um, value, and we can actually get these pronounced. So for example, if I do D here, we can actually get, make sure I the right thing is printed out. Yes, okay. So yeah, so when you actually run this right here, we can see that there's these two groups that were created. That was from the create PDFs, basically. Um, or yeah, create PDFs. And we can see like the overlap is 1.124, which is basically how much of this overlap, this purple area exists. And then the superiority, basically how much, how likely is it that one value is over the other one? So you can see as I increase or decrease D, for example, I have one here you can actually see there's a lot significantly smaller overlap. You can see there's still an effect, okay? And then this one right here, I put D equals four, and you can see there's almost like no effect at all. Um, you can almost, you, you can say there's, a, there's an overlap here, but that's likely just because of pure chance, not likely because it's an actual, um, like not because there's an actual overlap effect from between, let's say this is treatment and this is placebo. Um, it's likely that this is pure chance. And not something else. So you can see that we're, the cutoff that usually for a lot of groups, like this is this is considered a very large effect. And you can see there's actually not that much difference from between here and the 0 0.02. And you can see like 0 0.01 or even smaller. You can see very very small and basically like almost no effect. Okay. So this is how we can use the D statistic. I'm basically kind of working backwards instead of saying here's the populations. Let's calculate the D statistic. Instead of saying here's a D statistic. This is what the populations would look like. So. That's kind of what's going to be here. Okay, cool. So any questions on um, what these things are basically looking at? The superiority, overlap, anything like that? Okay, so again, uh, basically your overlap um, is determining how much this stuff is crossing over, right? And then your superiority basically say when one value is bigger than the other, okay? And then your D statistic is like an overall metric of like, you know, what these values are supposed to represent. Okay, cool. So again, definitely look at the curriculum. There's like, I think it's like a good, like, it's a good long section that kind of go walks through and does a good job explaining those parts and trying to code it and go through step by step. But I basically gave you a summary right here. All right. So this leads us into t-tests. So t-tests are probably what we'll likely do for a lot of these tests and stuff like that, um, because it basically can, um, like I said before, our t-statistic, our statistics are giving a summary of the data. Um, and basically, it's assuming some stuff with approximation or our distribution. So um, let's see here. Yeah, we can use this basically for hypothesis testing and our t distribution. Okay. So if you remember um, when we do a t distribution, the larger our t, I'm sorry, the larger our sample, the number, the higher the degrees of freedoms, right? The more likely it is a normal curve, right? Um, basically, we can the t distribution becomes closer and closer to a normal curve, um, and we can do that because of the central limit theorem. But note that that means we are making some assumptions. So assumptions um, is that we are predicting that it's normally distributed. That means the population data actually is normally distributed, 
If it's not normally distributed for some other reason, then the t-test actually wouldn't do a good job doing this because it's assuming that it's approaching a normal curve as we get more and more, um, as we increase the degrees of freedom. So this is actually really important. And you should kind of think about this beforehand. Say, do we think the population data actually is normally distributed? And no, in real, the real world, we usually don't know what the population data actually looks like just because no one's kind of taken the whole sample of like the whole population. But we can usually get an idea of saying, you know, well, do we expect these things? And usually for the most part, the world tends to go towards a normally distributed, um, uh, a normal curve and everything, okay? A um, couple things to note too is that when we use the t-tests, um, we're comparing the sample means. So basically we're comparing multiple samples means with each other, whether that's with the population, a known population mean, um, and our sample, or even two samples saying, are these two samples, um, are these two samples different? Like how do they differ? Okay, um, know that we usually don't know the population um, standard deviation. So that's why we're not using a z-test, for example. z-test, usually we're assuming that we know the full population information. t-test, we really don't know. So that's why we're able to do this, okay? And then you'll note here, I'll say like you need to be large. And large is actually like an, um, basically more than 30 samples or 30 individual data points, right? And I don't know about you guys, but when I first heard about this, I remember learning about this in high school and I was like 30, like, that seems so small. Like, are you sure like that's enough? That's a large sample. And really it's that the fact that, he, um, the fact that most data tends towards a normal distribution. If you remember back from last time, it was yesterday, we showed like those graphs of like the normal curve, I think it was in blue. And then we showed the T distribution as we increased the number of um, degrees of freedoms. You'll notice that by the time we got to 30, Basically, it was like almost exactly like a normal curve. And that's really what this is coming from, is that it's like if the population is a normal curve, we expect our sample, basically our sample to look similar to a, um, a normal curve as we did multiple times over and over. That's why that's where that number comes from. But of course, the bigger the better. But we say like if it's less than 30, then we probably need to get some more samples in that case. And this is more for like, um, you can think of it like, like I'm thinking like a medical field, for example. And so you can put like multiple researches and put those together. Okay, that's where this has come from. Um, one thing I kind of noted, pick your alpha before testing. Um, it's really important to make sure you have a solid understanding of what you're gonna be looking for before you go into it. Um, and it's not just necessarily for like being sure you're a good data scientist and that people can trust you. It also is for your own sake is that you might not realize the things you're doing if you start tweaking some things. You know, sometimes it's easy to forget what we're doing. We're just doing all the numbers. We're doing our code and stuff like that. And then forgetting that, oh, wait, we need to set this alpha value ahead of time so we know that, hey, when this alpha hits this part, we know that's when it's significant. Okay, so I can't emphasize that more, um, but it's an important factor because you might accidentally Basically, you, you'll start essentially starting to fit onto this alpha. So we'll talk about a little bit like overfitting and like machine learning, but I like to think of it as like the same idea that we're trying to like fit too well onto this alpha and that can be bad, okay? So anyway, um, and then assumptions, like I said, independent data, uh, basically that each, when you, each data point doesn't affect the other one, that's an important thing. Um, that one, for the most part, we can assume um, there's very, there's very few circumstances where we'd actually consider it's not independent with each other, but something you should kind of double check and say, this doesn't make sense that the data points, that each data point would be independent from the other one. Um, randomly sampled, like I said before, um, that's the ideal, is that we have it randomly sampled in some way. In reality, you will never get perfect randomly because uh, random samples because nothing's like, things are too connected to each other. Um, even like having like a large data set can not necessarily mean random because um, like you think of like um, people polling on the internet, for example, that's still a set of people who are likely to actually do give information on the internet. Um, for example, you might be excluding people, like let's say you look at someone, um, some kind of internet information that was collected. Maybe are those only English speaking people? Are those people only in the US or the UK or you know, wherever you're looking at? Um, are they only a certain age group that's actually um, proceeding through? You know, for example, let's say, do you need to include, you know, people of different ages? Like for example, people are over 65 are they likely to participate in this data set? And maybe not. So those are the things that you have to kind of have to consider. Um, and like I said, we assume that the population is normally distributed from the central limit theorem. Um, but it's a good double check to think, you know, is it, does it make sense that this population would be normally distributed? 
Okay. So then um, just the basic steps for the t-test. It's basically you get your question, what are you testing for? And then that basically determines your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis. Again, write these down ahead of time. <laughs> Don't, um, again, you're trying your best to try to like be impartial to the testing. Um, there is a real danger of when you're doing your statistical test to accidentally put your bias in what you're trying to find. So it's important to write it ahead of time before, like basically you wanna make sure you know what you're looking for before you start looking. Because otherwise you might try to adjust, you know, it's like, oh, like this would have been significant if I was looking for this kind of value instead. And that can be kind of dangerous. So again, I'm trying to like emphasize, put it ahead of time, your null hypothesis, your alternative hypothesis. Okay. And then, um, excuse me, this will determine basically your alpha and p value. So like basic, or not, this will determine, you need to determine what your alpha and p value are. So basically, where do you make the cutoff? When do you accept and reject, or sorry, when do you reject null hypothesis? Uh, what point is that? In some places or in some fields, it might be um, smaller, sometimes it's bigger, but in this case, um, usually it's about 0.05. Um, that's usually the standard. Okay. And then after that, you take your t your this your samples, get your t value, your, your sorry, your t statistic, basically that describing factor. Um, basically, it's similar to the z score. It's um, basically how far away from the mean or the expected mean that your sample mean is from. Um, and this is in the curriculum too. It talks about how to calculate this t statistic. But for the most part, we actually don't calculate it by hand. Usually, it's easier just to kind of use a package because then we can just run it over and over again. Okay, because it's the same value every time or same formula every time. Um, but note that this is different from one sample and two sample, which we'll talk about. Um, and then you find your t critical t value, which is dependent on what kind of thing you're looking for, what your alpha is, basically what p value you're looking for. And this is again done by um, a package. Um, you might remember back if you did like in high school, maybe even like university, where you'll have like, if you do statistics, you have this big chart with like the t values and like all these numbers and stuff like that. Um, basically it's because for the most part, statistics hasn't had like uh, computers to do it for you every single time. So you look it up in a chart. Um, similar to like, I think, I think we, we as a group right now are probably um, too young to remember this, but I remember um, that people would talk about um, sine, sine and cosine charts. It's the same thing. The reason why they had sine and cosine charts was because you didn't have a calculator, you didn't have a computer to calculate this for you. Now we can just put sine of whatever you know, number we want and you pit out a number. Um, before you get to these charts. Same idea for the t-statistic. So you'll notice sometimes people talk about a t-chart. You don't really need a t-chart. You can just use the basically the formula um, that's built into the computer okay, or into your package that you're looking at. Okay. And then the final step is you compare your critical t-value, which is the one that you calculated for, based on like what you're trying to look for, your sample, your degrees of freedom, your alpha, and your actual t-statistic that you measured from your sample. And you basically want to compare that and say, basically at that point you can say you do accept or reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Um, one sample and two sample, basically it kind of comes down to the fact that if you're looking for a difference or basically if one's greater or smaller. So for a one sample test, um, I have here, do snicker bars actually weigh less than 120 grams? It says on the package. I actually know what it says on the package, but just say it's 120 grams. Like, oh, like maybe if we take a bunch now of Snickers and we weigh them themselves, maybe it's actually smaller than 120 grams, which is what they say is the average, because it won't be exactly 120, but is it signif statistically significantly smaller than 120 grams? You know, maybe they're lying to us. So in that case, you'll see usually like our distribution like this in our sample. And then you usually will see something like if this is our alpha, it's 0 0.05. And basically anything over here, if our T statistic um, ends up being within this range, that means that we can reject the null hypothesis, saying it's really unlikely that we would get a t-statistic in this range if the null hypothesis was true. That's basically what's happening here. Um, for a two-sample test, um, so this is for one sample, so saying that it's greater, it's wet, less than, right? So really it should be on this side, but it's basically just one part of the tail. It's less than or greater than. If you're looking at something and said, does the control group and treatment group just differ, so in this case, we're comparing two um, means, you know, that's kind of the same idea as the population mean and the sample mean. But basically, oh, are these two different from each other? Well, that would actually be two parts of the tail. So basically, if your t statistic ends up being here or here, then you can reject the null hypothesis. But note that if I have like an alpha value of 0 0.05, 
that means basically this alpha gets split in half. So half of it's in here, half of it's in here, if that makes sense. So in this case, it's actually like, you know, you can think of it like this, if you want it on this side, this would be the equivalent of trying to find an alpha of uh, 0 0.025 for the one sample. That's the kind of the equivalent. And this is why it's important to know ahead of time saying, what are you actually trying to measure? If you actually do care, it's like, okay, the thing we really care about is it, is it less than, then you really should use a one sample. If you're doing something where you're just seeing if they're not equal to each other, um, then you're looking for a two sample. But if you, let's say, for example, this is what I'm talking about, like you might get into these weird areas where you're like, oh, this is not kosher. Is that, let's say you do a two sample t-test, okay? And you're like, okay, let me see if there's like, the snicker bars are just different. You know, maybe it's less, maybe it's more. And you get a value, let's say this is like 0 0.025 and you get a value that's right here. And you're like, ah, shoot, just outside of it. And you're like, hmm, well, you know, I really wanted to see if they weighed more. And that's when you actually adjust right here and try to do a one sample t-test what you'll find is like, oh, look, now it is significant because now we're accounting for not just this part, but also all of this. And that's where it's important to know ahead of time, what are you actually testing and what actually matters? Um, and this is where it's important to do it before you ever look at the data because otherwise you can get into this realm where you're trying to adjust and make things significant, where in reality, maybe it didn't make sense to do that. Okay, cool. All right, any questions on um, just like kind of what we're looking at right here? This is a very high level of like essentially what you're doing. Like if you think of like all the stuff that we write in our code, this is like all you're doing. Like every single time for your teeth test and everything like that, just figuring out how you proceed and basically you're using the comparison um, to figure out if you reject or um, reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Cool. All right. So I'll move on to the next part here. Let's see how much time I have. Ooh. Talking a lot. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about um, for this for G statistics in particular is errors. So we'll t here to type one and type two errors. Have you guys ever heard this before? Okay, you might have heard it. Um, I always, to be honest, I always get confused which one's type one and type two errors. Um, so you can really think of like type one errors is just false positives, and then type two is false negatives. So false positives actually directly tied with alpha, which makes sense, right? If you have a smaller alpha, you are a bigger alpha. Right? So if you imagine like if you have your distribution, right, in your alphas here, if your alpha is larger, right, you might have more likely to say, oh, this is true. Well, that means it's significant too. You know, this is where we have a larger alpha, basically, you're more likely to get a false positive to say, oh, no, it is it likes, like, oh, it is different from the null hypothesis when in fact, oh, no, your alpha is just too high. This is actually usually why we use about 0 0.5. Um, you can adjust that to smaller part. So let's say, for example, like, oh, well, let's say we have a alpha 0 0.01. Well, the problem with this is that now when we have that small, like let's say really small over here, now we might accidentally get a false negative where maybe this is the effect right here. Okay, like, so this is where our, 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 our T statistics ends up being, but our critical value is right here. Um, and basically there is an effect, but we didn't, we made our alpha too small. Now we can have false negatives basically say, oh, no, like there is no effect, no hypothesis. Um, we, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, um, but it's because we have this false negative and this is called our beta. And when we usually try to do this, we usually try to go for 0 0.2. So note that um, alpha is kind of like, kind of like two sides. You make it too big, you make it too small, you have different kinds of errors. Um, one way we can fix this is basically just having like more um, samples. If we have more samples, it means that we can probably, we can keep in, the facts like, well, we probably won't have that probability factor. Um, if we have, you know, 500,000 samples um, or data points in our sample, right? Is that we likely won't have that issue of having false and um, so false negatives and false positives. Like it kind of ends up balancing out better. So that kind of leads us to the next part. Um, I also put a statistical power, um, really just a description of beta, but the curriculum kind of talks about it a little bit. So I just kind of threw that in there. Um, real quick, does anyone, questions on errors? Um, note that sometimes you'll hear, especially in the medical field, call it sensitivity and specificity, also recall. Um, these are the opposite, essentially saying, you know, true positives, true negatives, and there's a whole bunch of other like little rates that you can calculate and stuff like that between accuracy and precision. So just know that you'll see these kind of terms used um, throughout statistics. Okay. So I, I would, um, honestly, the Wikipedia page for if you look up sensitivity versus specificity, 
if you looked at the Wikipedia page, it does a pretty good job of showing a lot of the different rates and stuff like that. Okay, so I think I have one more notebook I wanted to go over real quick. Okay, yes. Okay, so this is um, the last part of the curriculum goes through. So A-B testing, which I'm not going to talk a whole lot about um, unintended consequences, and it's something called an analysis of variance. Um, the curriculum talks about these two things. Um, I kind of wanted to go through a couple of them. Uh, multiple comparisons. This is actually a really important one, I think, is that this is one of those things where you can accidentally, if you're not careful, these are like all these things you can think of. Like these, if you're not careful, you might accidentally um, prove some, not prove something, but you might say something significant when it really isn't. I think I showed this comic before with XKCD where um, they have, you know, basically they're testing jelly beans and they're like, oh, these jelly beans, what do they even say? Cause acne. Like it's like, oh, jelly beans cause acne. And they find out, oh, the p-value is not, you know, p-value is bigger than 0.05. Like, cool. And they're like, oh, wait, he's like, I think it's from a different color or from a specific color. So then they test out all the 20 colors of the jelly beans. And one to know is basically in this little part right here, they find that p-value is actually less than 0.05. And they say, whoa, that's so strange. And then basically the news article ends up saying, oh, jelly beans are linked to acne. Um, and the reason why this ended up happening is because they tested again and again in different samples. So it probably, based on all of these, the color probably has no effect, but because we tested the jelly beans over and over and over again, we expect that basically one out of 25% of the times we try a sample will actually get something that does look like it has an effect, even though it really doesn't. So this is being really careful about doing multiple comparisons over and over again. You have to basically be aware that your one sample from here might actually not be significant. And that's something you have to be aware of. Um, there's also uh, this great website, which I think the curriculum actually uses some of the pictures in there, but um, uh, it's actually really, uh, it's a really great website. Basically they start, start finding um, other, uh, what's it called? Um, connections that correlate with each other. So US spending on science and hanging suicides, for example, um, are very well correlated. You can see that significantly coming together here. Um, number of people who drowned by falling into a pool and films Nicholas uh, Cage appeared in. So again, these are kind of a fun things where you can find correlations. But basically the reason why these correlations exist is not because, I mean, hope, not because of the films Nicholas Cage appeared in actually connected to drownings in a pool, but um, it's because we're comparing multiple things. You can try to find any relationship by taking any data you have and just see if things are correlated together. Um, these are basically, how you can find like really funny and weird looking like um, correlations and realize like, oh, there's like, there's a, there might be some reason why this is happening. But in reality, it's just because you're doing multiple comparisons. Um, the reverse of this, which I think most people understand is correlated parts that affect the same thing. So a classic one is um, they talk about uh, the number of um, number of drownings are correlated in like, the number of drownings in um, a month is correlated to amount of ice cream consumed. But the reason why those are correlated is because summertime, the weather's nice. People don't usually usually um, go swimming in the winter and people are less likely to eat ice cream in the winter because it's already cold. But in the summertime, it peaks up for a both basically people who go swimming, which means more drownings, and also people who just eat more ice cream. So those are like correlated with each other because of another factor. These ones, it's unlikely that the people who drown in the pool is somehow correlated with something else, you know, with the films Nicolas Cage appeared in in those years. It's just by pure chance, essentially. And that's because you can only, you can find these things because you're comparing multiple things. You can find all the relationships you can and see what everything correlates with each other. Okay, cool. So something to kind of be, keep in mind. Um, any questions on that? Cool, all right. It's pretty straightforward, I think. All right, and the last thing, um, kind of running a long time, but I'll just mention is A-B testing. Basically, A-B testing is doing statistical testing, um, but uh, we're determining basically one thing you want to figure out instead of you kind of working backwards. So instead of getting a sample and then figuring out, you know, if it's significant or not, sometimes what you'll do is say, well, I want to see if it's significant. So you say, okay, what's our alpha that we want? What's our beta that we want? And basically you can use that to figure out the number of people or number of subjects you can use in your study. So, um, this is where A-B testing kind of comes from. I, I actually wonder if, I, I never really thought too much of it, but I wonder if A-B testing is just essentially coming from alpha, beta. Some of this said A and B because it's alpha and beta. I don't know, I could be wrong. But um, <laughs> not, you know, I never really thought much about it, but 
now I'm looking, looking at alpha, beta here, not A, B here. Maybe that's where it's coming from. But basically use alpha in your beta and say, what do you want for your alpha? What do you want for your beta? And then you figure out the number of subjects you would need to achieve those alpha and beta without basically counteracting with each other. Um, note that this right here, this P represents the probability. This actually represents the probability of the, what's it called? The probability of the sample of, of the population. So that's why this is it's a sigma here, not an S. Um, so we're trying to find the variance. And basically this right here, this P might not be known, but you might have an idea of what this P should be, um, which can help you figure out the variance. And this N right here is just the number of people um, if you're looking at for a specific sample. So for example, um, what things you're already looking at. So curriculum goes through this a little bit more, um, but basically it's kind of like working in reverse, saying like, what, how many people do we need to have to make sure we have a significant test? Okay, um, last thing, unintended consequences. Um, this is kind of a classic one. Um, the, the curriculum talks about this one particular about COBRAs. I think it was for India um, during colonial rule. Um, or maybe it's not, but I think it mentions about India. Basically, it was like they had a cobra problem in the city and they were like, whoa, we have too many cobras. So you know what we need to do? We need to, um, I'll put out basically a bounty. The more cobra, basically every cobra skin that you have proving that you killed a cobra, um, you get like a dollar or whatever it is, right? Um, basically a reward. And so it actually put down the cobra population, but then what happened, um, anyone got an idea what would ha what happened? And, History. I believe the story goes that people started uh, breeding their own cobras to make a profit. That's right. So now you're like rewarding people for basically trying to get rid of cobras. But then it's like, hey, if I breed cobras and kill them, then I can make more money. And that's kind of the unintended consequences. So always be careful um, when you use the metric that you're trying to measure against. Um, it can be really dangerous. And that's the same thing when I say like, if it, you have to set your alpha ahead of time. If you make your alpha your goal, like, you know, trying to get the right alpha, you end up trying to test around that. You get more samples, you're trying to get this, and you kind of get it until it works out. And this is even true for like a business sake, like if you're working with someone who's a business, businesses love metrics because they're easy to calculate, but it's kind of unintended consequences where it's like, oh, if you make this the metric your goal, then suddenly what happens is that they'll start doing things that are not exactly what you wanted, but technically fit that goal. So I think that's a good, um, explanation down here in this uh, part of the curriculum. Cool. All right. So that's kind of my quickly going through the curriculum, seeing those parts. Um, definitely the parts where I didn't really go into. Um, you know, if I didn't talk about that at all, but um, I would definitely look at the, cur uh, the curriculum that talks about these parts, the effect size, and basically the t-testing, stuff like that. Um, definitely read that through, see how it's done. Um, they do have a lot more detail in it. And I just summarize it on the bottom here. Okay, um, basically go through those parts is what I would strongly suggest. And then of course, curriculum in general. Cool, um, you guys have any questions? Cool, all right, I'll go ahead and stop my screen.